I can't handle right now. I mean, I we're going to stream live. I've had all all I can handle right now. I am at the point right now of where you know, I all I could say is welcome and fuck it. That's it. Fuck it all. You know, <laughs> I've had I've had I've had all I could take. This is it. Fuck it. That's all I say. Fuck it. <laughs> you know. And God, God, I mean, God forbid Bo would hear me say that. Man, she would have a heart attack right now. You know, she is like one of the sweetest human beings. And every time I use the word fuck, she goes, uh, uh, it's like she's going to have a heart attack. You know, it's like, but I say, baby, that's the most expressive word in all the human language. You know, that's it. There's no more expressive word than that word. It's an adjective. It's a noun. It's, you know, it's a dangling participle, whatever that might mean. But whatever it is, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's. it's you're I was not walking get down away the with those, uh, with those uh, explanations, Jan. I'm sorry. It's the most, it's the most versatile word in the English language, isn't it, Jan? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. It's the most versatile word in the English, English language. And by the way, welcome everybody to Thinking Out Loud with Friends. And uh, this is our 214th meeting. You are welcome to join the panel. And the only thing I'm going to say about that is that everything you hear today is opinion. So do your own research. There you go. And welcome everybody. So um, anyway, Jim, so as I was saying, life is what it is. Life is what you make it. I just emailed you the, the DM7 thing. Because it won't let me put it in the chat. Maybe I just don't know how to do it. All right. We'll talk about it again because those people who are listening right now might get some value out of this, if we could say. Uh, let's, and I'll tell you what. Let's make it nebulous in the point where how to get involved. But tell them what's about to happen with the DM7. Somebody's giving a DM7 class, All right. right. For Yes. For anybody who's in the Southern California area, in Fullerton, Mastermind Productions – uh, which is a small company, a husband and wife company, and they do sound and lighting, and they have absolutely great gear. It's oh. basic. It, they have uh, Ravages and CLs and QLs, or it's a Yamaha house for the most part. They have a handful of DM7s, and they're teaming up with Yamaha on July 25th to do two classes uh, on the DM7, a 10 o'clock in the morning class and a 2 p.m. class. And when Kate, who's the, the the couple is Kate and Chad. When Kate emailed with a K, by I, I might I might have mentioned it's spelled with a Kate. Right, although K. Uh, with a K, that's right. K is in Kate rather yep. than C is in Kate because right. I've never met anybody <laughs> who calls himself Kate with a C. But you know, these days with the millennials and the baby boomers, it could be Q U A T E. Who knows? Yeah, and it's you know. So uh, she said both classes are the same. It's just repeating. So it's not an advanced one in the afternoon, which is what I one of the things that I wanted to know. And uh, she said to hand it out to as many people that would like to come, you know, to she said to go ahead and, you know, go ahead and make it known to, to everybody. So that was perfect for tonight for anybody who's in the, you know, that wants to do this. So there you go. when is it again taking place? July 25th. July 25th, for those people using which, the Roman calendar, you know when it is. Which is a Thursday. Okay, you know. <laughs> so Ken and perfect. Chris and Bruce, do you all want to go to the same session? I'm going to the morning one with Gary and a couple of my friends. Uh, I've done two shows on it so far, but I know they're going to tell me things that I don't know about it. So, And I just love to go down there. He's got such a beautiful shop, and Chad's a great guy. So I'm going down. I'm going in the morning. Now, think, even though it's not sponsored by Yamaha, are there going to be a Yamaha reps down there? The, yeah, well, one one of the signups is Kate at Mastermind or the Yamaha. Uh, you can see it on the flyer that I sent you. There's two signups, so you're your best just to go to email Kate and tell her you want to come, and she'll get your information. But Yamaha will be there, yes. Hey so Bruce, I put, a, I put a link to the Master Training Education class right there in the chat for everybody. I see that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Who's doing the teaching? Do you know? Is it Chad I don't know. or a Yamaha person? Well, it might be Chad, but since Yamaha's involved, it's probably a Yamaha. When they've done this in the past with other things, uh, I went to the uh, Ravage one, and it was a Yamaha person. So I went there when the DM7, before the DM7 was actually released, and that's where I was introduced to the DM7, was there, and I got, got the rundown from the Yamaha guy, and it was really cool. Yeah, I went to NAM, uh, you know, because Chad always mixes out in front of the convention center and between the convention center and the Hilton. And the one year, you know, he couldn't talk about it. 
<laughs> and he took me into the trailer because it was before it was released and they had one in the trailer and he showed it to me. But he, he was using the Ravage to do the band. But uh, yeah, so I did see it. I didn't get a chance to touch it, but I, I knew it was coming. <laughs> it was like, oh, I'll tell you, the hardest thing is for me to get used to is is the fact that I think in eight, eight fader mindsets, and this is 12 faders. <laughs> Much better. Well, I'm getting used to it. And I've discovered after my second show that I'm starting to learn some shortcuts on the screen because the screen is packed full of crap. You know, there's, you know, it's it's a little it's a little slower to get around on than a QL or a CL. But once you once you sort of learn what they were thinking when they laid this thing out, you you can you you see it's like, oh wow, if I do that, it does this, you know. And there's so many user defined keys, which actually makes it really cool. And I, so, I would just dis, I would disagree that it's slower to get around. I thought it was very responsive and and pop to pop to whatever screen you wanted extremely quickly. Well, it's yeah, in that faster. respect, yes, but but okay, in sure the beginning, well, I had to dig for things and it just took me a few minutes to get places. It wasn't that sure. the it wasn't that its brain capacity wasn't fast enough. It was my, probably my okay. brain capacity. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, I'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had to go down into things to get the things that I didn't have to go down into before or at least as far, you know, because they've moved a couple of functions around and they call them something different, which kind of stumped me. But And I can't even think of what they were at the top of my head, but I just know everything is there. It's just laid out slightly different as far as going places. But yes, it's very responsive. Um, my finger didn't always work so well on the CL and the QL, so I had a pointer with the softy thing on the end, you know, that I used, used to work with mine. And this new screen... Is it seems to be very, very much better, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like outside because you know all the professional ski boats, you know they have screens now for you know engine uh, telemetry and all that stuff when you're out in the sun water skiing, and you know why can't consoles have screens that show up in the sunshine, you know? But I think what I've heard is the Yamaha, the new DMs do so. And I've used the DM3 a couple times, and you know it's it's, it's a little sucker, but boy, I'll tell you the damn thing sounds really good. <laughs> uh, that's good, man. That's really excellent. It sounds great, yeah. So if you need a, I'll tell you, with all the little consoles out there with you know X32s and M32s and all that crap, and the TF TF, you know, Yamaha TF, and you know all that stuff, the new little DM3, what a sweet console, and it's easy to get around on, and it sounds really good, you know. It's so let me, let me say again what I said before, Bruce. If you're attending this seminar in uh, in, in Fullerton at Chad's place, if we can uh, get the message ap across to Yamaha slash Steinberg that we want that VST rack software to be yeah. available for let me us. write that down. The VST rack software is what they uh, sort of recommend to use with the uh, USB interface for plugins, you know? Oh. Yeah. So you, you have that USB interface that gives you 18 in, 18 out, 18 out USB C technically. And then uh, they recommend the VST rack software. But the way they have it licensed is that how do you get the VST rack software? You, the owner of the DM7, get one license uh, to oh. put on one computer. And that's it. So I said to the guy okay. from Yamaha, how that's... are we how are we freelancers supposed to set up a, a yeah. setup? Before we get there, he said, uh, let me fix you up. You know, like, don't tell anybody. Okay, so I'm sorry I'm telling you. But uh, anyway, so he yeah, fixed Yeah, but that me shouldn't up. be. That shouldn't be. They should sell that software for 100 bucks standalone, but they don't presently, and that's really bugging me because it's, it's fine software. Now, granted, there are two other software programs that do virtually the same thing, but they're not Yamaha Steinberg. So I wonder if they do it as smoothly and it would use, use as little memory and as little latency as the VST rack software. And those other programs are, um, what's it called? Professor, audio professor or something like that. Uh, live professor, maybe. Are you familiar with it? It's no. a program, program with which you can use many different types of plugins and run those plugins on your computer as your as your you know the processor is your computer and oh, then the wow. other one is waves performer so waves performer uh uses your computer as the processor instead of the typical waves way as they use a waves server and you connect through a waves interface of some sort that's not happening on this mixer yet so the waves uh performer is accomplishes the same thing as vst rack but 
it does it differently, I'm sure. So I don't know what's better or worse, but I felt like when I was, you know, using that console for the first time, I wanted to use what they suggested, which was VST rack. So they fixed me up and um, I felt very lucky that they did. Well, that's well, very cool. Let me ask you a question, Kenny, regarding the differences between what you're just talking about right now and the Waves server. Isn't the Waves server have a license that goes with the board itself or the or the or the extreme server compared to so you only get one license as well? Uh, it's a different the kind difference? of situation. The difference is that you can that people that don't own the console can, can use the Waves software because you buy that software separately. In, in Yamaha land, you cannot buy that software separately. You have to buy the either that DM7 series console or uh, what's that, RUIO16, that thing, that box, you get it with that also. But that's the only way you can get that software uh, technically. And so, um, you know, the, the goal in my mind is to get them to sell it independently, sell, sell that VST rack software independently. And I think the guy from Yamaha told me that it's a Steinberg glitch because of their policy about selling software so i'm not sure what that means hmm. right but but my understanding now do you own a bunch of waves plugins or sure. because i know that when i know that you know for example kurt when when he when he made a purchase of the of of his digital consoles he needed um he needed some uh waves a wave server as well and he had to buy all of these different plugins so that when a traveling engineer came in he was able to allow them to have whatever plugins they want am i right on that kurt we were just talking that's about the, the licenses yeah that's the licenses for the plugins what i'm talking about is the actual program that that runs the plugins and in this case, it's running them on a computer, not on a independent waves or however, uh, you know, independent server. It's running them on your own computer, uh, you know, and, and it's so it's really basic. And so it's called, I think they call that native, but I'm not positive. Well, I anyway. think the difference is Ken wants to show up with his laptop and plug it into somebody else's DM7 and use his stuff. With us, we have it all sitting on a server preloaded with the waves plugins but we are relying on the touring guy to bring his licenses to run up so it's yeah, kind of and that's and, but and, and by the way the the uh, in the case of waves what's it called uh super rack super rack sound grid mm. or super yeah. rack performer super rack sound grid works on the wave server super rack performer works on the in, you know internal computer processing so the um the difference is that you can buy those programs you cannot buy DSP rack, uh, DSP whatever VST rack uh, from from Yamaha Steinberg. That's the problem. What's Steinberg's involvement? They uh, do the software with Yamaha. Oh, when you when you go to download that software, you're going you're going to Steinberg's website. So it's a licensing deal that they have with Yamaha, probably that's they go like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess Gamble didn't have anything like that, hey? Yeah, I don't, I don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah, good for you. You walk over to the right side of the console and you plug it in. The only plug-in you got is that one. Yep. Well, you need a paintbrush so, and an air compressor, so, but you need a license. Oh, uh, you need a license for the air compressor. That's all right. That's, yeah. uh, that, that works for me. So, um, let's see. What's going on? What else? What else is happening around in the world, other than the DM sevens? Is that your choice of console now, Bruce? The DM seven? <laughs> Boy, that's a tough one. I think it may be because it's just a great. It sounds good, and it it uh, there's more more. You know, Yamaha gives you a really nice assortment of uh, Neve and you know Dugan and a bunch of stuff, but Neve and some other you know plugins, and they expanded on it. On the DM7, and so. I love I love the way the Dugan is implemented on there. What sixty four oh, channels? Oh, it's so available? much better. Oh, oh it's my fantastic! God. Yeah, it's it's now, like light years better than the CLQL. But the problem with it is, and here's one of the examples, right? So 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 if you look at a, a, a strip, like you know, you bring up you know your 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 fader strip, you know, with all your information on it for your fader, right? Up at the top or somewhere, there's the little Dugan signal, right? And you think. Oh, this is bitching. All I do is turn it on and it works. And you press the button and the light lights up and you screw with it and you discover that it's not actually working. So you have to go to the Dugan page, which is somewhere else. 
and you have to tell, you click on channel one of the Dugan, and these two little tiny slots come up where you assign it to channel one in the console, if that's where you happen to want it, in and out, and it inserts it there, and it's permanently on post fade, and it does not take up your, I think the DM7's got four inserts, which is just mind boggling because the QL and CL had two and the CL was very limited in how you used them. So, you know, the, the, the <laughs> you okay, Ken, you're shaking my computer. <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, yes, it's going to be probably my console of choice. Uh, the show I did last week, you know, Mike asked me what console I wanted. And I said, listen, I've done the show a billion times. I got the show on the CL, just send me the CL. So I did. And the whole week I was there, I was just thinking, Man, I could have been sliding around on the DM7, and getting even better at it, you know. And but you know, it will be. Yeah, I have no doubt that it will be because it's. They, it's they a, might do the Dugan that way, so you can't accidentally engage. You know it. what? You are well, absolutely fantastic. right. It's well, it's well implemented. If yes, right, indeed. it's well I implemented. It. And once I figured it out, it took me freaking hour to figure out where the hell it was. Yeah, once I figured Dugan it out, logo. it's that Dugan thing. Yeah, right? but but it isn't. <laughs> But I mean, you click on that and it lets you lets you into the Dugan world, you know. Sort of, yeah. So well, it, the light lights up and says it's on, but it's it's on. It's just not engaged in that fader, right? So once once I figured that out, I was like, oh, you know, this makes total sense. So you don't do it by accident. Yeah, you know, yeah you know, it's you, be very intuitive. You don't you don't want to by accident turn the Dugan on your kick drum channel. You know that would just not be good. Well, the new Midas, it's the same kind of deal where anything that's going to be like potentially critical error you have to hold the button long enough for the little highlight to go around the switch like you oh. gotta commit to the idea that you I know like the old uh solo in place button on uh on some consoles yeah. like on the where was that and i know on the amac it had to hold it yeah, down the job like button seconds. push the button lose your job <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> that's why it had the cover over it you know, the other great thing about the DM7, it's got 32 inputs and, in, in, what, 16 outputs right on the back of the DM console. So is it 16 or is it, you know, it's got 48. 32 and 16, yeah. Yeah. So unlike the CL, which only gives you 8 and 8, you know, if 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 a bunch of people decide they want some laptops in front of house, because I do corporate shows, and you need all these analog ins and outs because they sprung it on you and you didn't bring any of your other tricky Dante t devices, you know, you just you just poke stuff right into the console and you tell it where you want those inputs to show up. And, you know, you're it, it just took all the limits away from the Yamaha console. That console is just pretty bitching. I'd love it if it had one more bank of 12 faders. <laughs> yes, yes. Please tell the Yamaha you know, guys. They you know need, what? You know, they have that little expander. You, you know you what? That thing Ch at, which which is place. cool, but it's only four faders. And right? and is it useful? You know, can you change you know those Char faders per bank? No, yep. it's just yeah. they're fixed to those four things. So, so make it a little more expensive and give me 12 more. I don't give a shit. I do corporate shows. I want 12 more faders. 12 more faders. And it doesn't have to have a screen with it. They <laughs> no, it doesn't sell, have to have they a can, screen. They could sell a 12 channel or 12 fader. Expander module. Yeah, if they could come up with that. That would Side make that console primo. So yeah. you know what's funny, though? And, and be aware, you guys, who don't know this, and probably some of you guys already do. But when you get the little expander thing that sits on the side, it's got the jog wheel, which we had. They haven't figured out what to use it for yet, which is kind of funny. And it's got four faders, and it's got a shitload of extra user defines. And, you know, it's got all this cool stuff on it. But it's only, like, five inches wide. And it makes the console, like, five inches longer, right? Well, how that patches in to the console is an ethernet cable and it has its own it has its own ip address so it's not just to plug it in and it freaking goes oh there you are and it just works you know all of a sudden now you know you have this thing that's theoretically built into the console now and you've got to do the ip address thing and you have to know the ip address of the console and it's got to be like 001 or 002 it's got to be in that range you know so that it sends all the information back and forth. And, you know, I'm not a networking guy. You know, I know enough about that stuff to be dangerous. And when it doesn't work half the time, I don't know what to do. It, when it works, it works great. But when it doesn't work, I have to call somebody. <laughs> so you but, want an Apple console then is what you're looking for. Well, pretty much. You know, if you're going to give me an expander module, why is it? Be, why do I have to hook it up with an Ethernet con cable, you know? <laughs> Can you link two full desks together and make one out of it? Yes. Well, according to what they say, I haven't read anything about it yet, and I haven't tried it yet. But I'm I'm under the understanding that you can. Well, mm -hmm. then there's what about the neural link? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. I did not know that. 
Uh, about the link and the desk together or about the yeah, the link and if you could do two dm7s linked together by ethernet i they, well they i don't know if it's by together. ethernet but i i was told that you can link them together but i just i've never done it and i don't know how i know that little expander module thing there is an ethernet cable and it's yeah, for sure yeah it well, talks it talks via it's you like know it's ip addresses it's, it's a remote yeah it's a remote yeah. i There's, bet ken yeah, could get George, his yamaha he, guy to send him one so they can try yeah yeah well, you know, we hey, probably Bruce. could try it out in, in Chad's chop next week or in July because, yeah. you know, he's yeah. got Bruce. a bunch of. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, are you sure it's not a neural link where it connects to you itself and that way you could control it just by thinking? That could be cool. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we'll have to talk to Elon Musk about that. Maybe he can come up with something like a <laughs> stick in my ear and plug into the console, you know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Linking consoles together, I mean, you theoretically you can you can link uh uh two wings together you can wing, uh, you can link two x32s together but you can't be sharing the same buses and and you know uh you know it's not linked together it's just you know it's, well you just run them side by side you patch them together but right yeah. Aux one should you should be able to take aux one from one console input twelve right and aux one from input twelve on another console and when you turn them up that should come out of aux one doesn't matter wouldn't matter but you'd have to make one as the master and one as the slave yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. or not yep they, 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 I bet they have a way to do a way to do that these days well older I think some of the earlier digital consoles you could well, link them like, together that like, way couldn't you well the uh like they're you know those consoles i think the ql or the cl or something have what do they call them sum ins or something just like they had on the 4000 they had like a sum in like a rib it's a ribbon connector or something and no no i'm just no? talking about on, on the xrs but oh. the and, and you can assign you know i'm pretty sure in the cl there's sum in somewhere or maybe it's the ql one of those has a sum ins because i remember i did a gig where i had a ql and a cl and I did the sum in thing because, and and then I think you can link link the VCAs somehow on those two consoles also. So there are mm -hmm. ways to link it, but uh, you know you're you've also got a master and a slave. Cool. <laughs> so we know what Bruce is uh, using these days, David. You use a lot of consoles. I mean, when you're traveling, it seems like you are really using a lot of consoles. I use all yeah. consoles. So, David, tell me about the Wing. It's such a gorgeous little console, and you know, I, I'm scared to death of anything made by Behringer, but I've heard that it's not a bad little console. I thought it was pretty cool. It sounded really good. It, it was looks great. Cool. It's pretty spacey looking. Giant screen. Lots of features. I was very happy with it. And How intuitive was it, David? Um, Behringer in general is less intuitive than most of the other consoles. Oh, yeah. So this is a Behringer. So therefore, it's less intuitive than I would like it to be. But it didn't take me long to figure out what I needed to know, and then it was okay. <laughs> you know, having been on so many of them, it's, you know, you, you, know, you can figure out stuff pretty easily. Well, let me ask you this, David. Uh, there's the Behringer Wing. There's the Midas, what's it called? HD96. HD96, yeah. So you've used both of those, I trust? Well, the HD96, I think, is a, a much more expensive console. Right. But my question is, intuitive le intuitiveness level of each one of those, how would you rate those? Like, compared to a Yamaha... If you're used to using Yamaha consoles, which a lot of us are, would yeah. you adapt well to one versus the other better? I would say that, first of all, in my opinion, Yamaha is the most intuitive of all the consoles. So being that as a given, of course, those other two are not as intuitive as Yamaha. Now, how far behind they are, uh, they're still Behringer's. And the Midas also has its oddness but uh i would say the behringer may be a little more difficult to figure out but with with the kind of brains that we all have on digital now we've all been doing them for decades you can figure it out it's not that hard you know the what, I, what i use as a as a guy you know, as a sort of a judge of how easy it's going to be is like when i look at a channel i bring the channel up on the screen and i want to do something like something simple like assign that channel to vca number one how do I do that? On Digico, 
it's totally what I would call ass backwards. You're not assigning to, you know, assigning that channel to a VCA group. You are joining a control group. You know, it's a whole big deal. So do you have to go to the VCA and then, and then go get the channel to bring it there kind of mindset, as opposed to the the Yamaha where you just, you just go there and you push the button and it says, Oh, okay. Exactly yeah. my exactly my interpretation yeah. of what I it found is. The digital on, the, on the Behringer slash wing slash Midas, uh, the v- DCA assigns are you hold down or DCA, and then you just as you hold it, everything lights up that's in that DCA, and you just hit the buttons. They make it very simple, but you have to know to hold down that button, that DCA button, and then it's good. You know, how, do you get to, how do you how do you get to the channels that don't happen to be on your surface right now? You can change the surface all you want. You can go to any one of the levels. If you're holding down the DCA button, your input levels are still are available, and you just go to each one and tap whatever you want to be into the DCA. Because what in digital in digital land, you can also go to the input list. You know, the channel list, I should say, and you can select them on there if you want. I don't remember if there's that, but what I wanted to bring up was in intuitiveness, one of the Midas things is you have to hold the button down long enough. If it's like Kurt said, if it's an important button and you're going to make a change, you need to hold it down. Well, that's not intuitive at all. You have to be told that, you know, you can sit there and try and enter stuff and it won't enter and you go, what the fuck am I doing wrong? And then you realize someone says, no, you have to hold the button down to do that. Yeah, that's a little weird because certain things will just happen immediately and certain things won't. It's only things that could end your gig that you have to hold the button down. If you want to just like turn on the phantom power, well, actually, that might be one of them. If you want to like turn on a compressor, you can just touch it and it'll happen. I think it's a great idea. The point is, it's not intuitive. You have to know to do it. And then there it is. It's easy. We were were playing with them the other day because we thought we were going to mix the show we just did on them, but we decided not to. And one of the weird things is like we had done in the shop, we'd saved some starter shows, you know, just so we could kind of have a template to work with. And then we went to fire them up and we pulled those shows up and none of the IO was configured. We had configured it in the shop and it was all working and passing signal. You know, we talked through it with a mic and routed it to speakers and all that stuff. And it turns out that, like on an M32, if you shave a save a show, when you fire back up, you'll have the show. On a HD96, you have to save a scene within the show, right. or you won't get any of the stuff you did. You'll have a thing that's called, you know, front of house starter, but nothing nothing you did will will come back unless you save a scene. Oh, that's a little scary. Yeah. I think not that's isn't that true on Digico? Isn't that true on Digico also, Kurt? I believe so. So if you lose power in the middle of one of your sessions, it's not, it'll come back. It's no, there's not- auto save and stuff like that. It's when you recall a scene. Right. Uh, or a show, a show file. The re- or, yeah, one of show. the reasons for that is, I mean, I used to travel with, uh, when when uh, Midas first came out uh, and they were big, I had a show file, okay? I ended up having to do my show file without any routing, because on an M32, uh, you would save your routing in your show file. You go to somebody else's system and you give it to the, uh, you know, to the A2, uh, you know, I would never load my own show file and say, here, here you go. Well, it brought up the routing for this other, uh, uh, the last system that I used, you know, and, all of a sudden, the, the monitor guy would lose all his inputs because the master console would reroute it to this other systems of routing. Yeah, so, you can set what what recalls and what doesn't on pretty much all yeah. of them. You can tell it not to change the the I/O config, and then you do that mm-hmm. manually. Right. A lot right. of people don't bother to do that, and it screws everything up, just like you just said. Right. But. Oh, that was my biggest beef with guest engineers because I'd have to do a corporate show for a week. And then like the third night of the five nights, we'd have like some band come in, some famous act, and they'd say, oh, I got it on my stick. And it's like, don't you dare. (laughs) So so I, I would I would always have him send me his show and then I would build my show around that show or send me his his Excel spreadsheet on the show. And I would just, 
you know, when I was, was when I was sitting around not doing anything, I would build his show on the extra faders so that when he came in, he wouldn't have to load anything on my console. Because you know, if you're if you're like Joe Yamaha and you're like an expert on that shit, isn't there ways to do that? Yes, properly. There, like you just yeah. load the. I don't know, you just load the inputs. Just certain the inputs. parts of it, yeah, or something, right? Yeah, that's yep. the reason why. Like, if you're doing, I I did a year of doing uh, what David's doing with a Tom Petty cover band. Tom Petty cover band, what they were only regional, but I would be going in. I had a thumb drive with, you know, 30 different show, show files shade, saved for every type of console. And wow. I would never load it. And I'd say, here you go. Look in the Midas folder or look in the wing folder or look in the Omaha folder. And the, the systems guy, I say, you do it. I ain't touching your system. There's my show file. Go grab it, and I'll you, verify it. You know what? In 30 years, 30 years, and it might just have been who it was, because you probably know, Kurt, you probably know people who know how to do this. I never had an engineer come in that knew how to load his file without totally destroying my console. Because I'd say, <laughs> you could load your file, but only load the inputs and start at you know, 40 or start at 30 or whatever. And they're like, oh, if I stick that in there, it's going to change the matrices and all the mixed buses and everything. It's like, you can't do that, man. <laughs> I got three days worth of corporate left and you'll totally screw me, you know? So, yeah. So I guess that's why you have to be a nice guy, hey? <laughs> it always especially helps. Especially the monitor guys. Especially the helps. monitor guys have to be super nice you know, to the front house guy. Otherwise, yeah, you're in trouble. You know, I never got I never got to be a good monitor guy, not because I didn't know how to do it, because I know how to do it. I built a lot of monitor systems, but I never had the patience to deal with the freaking musicians, you know, and, and that, the, the, you know, you got to be a certain kind of person to be a really good monitor guy because, you know, yeah, it's all about ears and mixes and all that shit. But boy, I'll tell you, you got to know how to deal with all those personalities on the stage and keep them smiling. That's, <laughs> why, that's, why, that's why Manilow's current monitor guy, who has been there for 12 years or more, uh, is so successful is because what is his degree in? Psychology. 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 Yeah. Psychology. Yeah. yeah. So he yeah. knows exactly what to do. How to deal with every him. situation. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's some really, some guy would right. say, can, that's what it takes. Can way I have more a, than, way more than I, technical knowledge. Can I have a little more shimmer in my voice? And I'd reach up and say, fuck you. It sounds great. <laughs> That's what that's what I would say too. Yeah, and, then, the, and that would be the then, last show I did. Then I would be I would be fired like the first day on the gig, you know. Yeah, you, do you guys, which I've proven, I've proven a few times, you know. Do you guys know the difference between a monitor guy and a toilet? <laughs> I have heard this, but oh, I don't remember. Know, the, the monitor guy only has to deal with one asshole at a time. Oh, oh no, yeah, the toilet, the toilet only has <laughs> to deal with one asshole at a time. That's so good. I gotta remember that. I have heard of that before. That's <laughs> wonderful. Oh my God. Some, I, some... I could never have the patience. You know, I like doing monitors for like local bands and, you know, bands that don't have big recording contracts that don't tour because they're usually, if I'm doing monitors, I'll have a pretty good monitor system and it's better than what they usually have. So they're very appreciative, but boy, you know, you get a name act in there and they could be anal bastards. It's like, bring your monitor guy because I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> I, uh, my first boss, I met my first boss, the Jersey Joe, remember him, David? Jersey, Jersey Joe. Joe, he would, he would say, he would say the the smaller the act, the more pain in the ass they are because, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to work their way up and they're not successful yet. And that kind of vibe. And they were always a big pain in the ass. The ones that were more successful, they were like, okay, this is what I want. This is how I want it. Boom. They're very cut and dry. But the, uh, but the ones that are on their way up and they're trying to do something. He was right. You know, they were such a pain in the ass. I would completely echo that. So I have worked with yeah. so many acts that was difficult enough that the monitor guys gave unbelievable monitors and yet they still weren't good enough. Yeah. And I decided way early in my career, I would rather listen to what I can make out of a band and to sound like a record than deal with individual musicians and deal with the troubles of a monitor guy. I, yeah, mean, I agree. I agree hundred percent. Now, on the other hand, the monitor guy always gets to know the band much better or the star and I'm stuck out in front and I'm just another guy. Great. You do a good job for me. Thank you very much. But we don't get to know each other. You know, one of the things about work with hotel California is we're living together. We're in the bus together. And all of a sudden I'm realizing what it's like 
to be part of a band. I've never had that before. And it's really nice. But that's the reason I never wanted to do monitors. I didn't care about not being part of the band. I just didn't want to deal with a drum mix and a headphone ear, a singer mix and a guitar mix. I wanted it the whole thing. You and I need a little more shimmer in you my vocal mic. Yeah. <laughs> everybody here, everybody hears differently. And and especially singers, when they're singing and listening to themselves, you can't hear what they're hearing. There's no way. And okay. even if you get it consistent from night to night, they're going to want something different because of maybe their mood or how their voice sounds or any number of reasons why they're going to want it different. And how do you react to that? It's just like, oh man, it's it's very challenging to do monitors. Uh, I was mixing monitors for Donna Summer at one of the casinos, working for her. And she came to me and said, I need more mids in the highs. Mids in the highs. Yeah. What are you going to do? It might have been more. I have, to tell, you all, I have, I have to... to tell you all about my very first and last major monitor gig. Now, this is way back in the day. Um, 1975, uh, Notre Dame Arena, uh, sound company was IES, okay? And we had a 24 by 8 Marshall monitor desk. It was hand-built by Jim Marshall. Wow. And, wow. um, and the, it, it, the bands were Derringer, Nugent, and Aerosmith. This is 1975. I was the third person on the crew, but just before the show, the monitor engineer got fired. So they <laughs> said, Greg, thousand dollars to do the show and and you'll get an eight ball if you do well if you survive <laughs> <laughs> and i said sure and so the band goes off and i was trying to be diligent and everything like that and you know steven tyler at that time was all in the wraps all these scarves and wraps it you know as part of his uh, uh on stage costume and about halfway through the show, uh, he starts taking off his wraps and he's wearing this T-shirt that says, I can't hear my fucking monitors and turns around <laughs> and gives, it, gives me a, it gives me the fingers. Oh, so, that's funny. So I got, you know, I got paid and the, you know, the stage manager and the road manager calmed him down and I said, I'm never doing monitors for them again. But to add insult to in injury, the cover of Cream Magazine that week was Steven Tyler giving me the finger saying, I can't hear my monitors. Uh, <laughs> you're famous. <laughs> my last you're famous, Greg Baker. You're game. famous. On that note, I got to leave. I got a six o'clock meeting. So take care uh, of you guys. Bruce, have fun. Have you. Right See you, man. Love you. Love See you guys. You. See you next week. Remember, VST yeah, like, rack, VST yeah, yeah. rack, individual purchase. That's so. If you've got a, uh, a lead singer who's really pissing you off, you just patch the harmonizer onto his channel, 100% <laughs> wet return, and just bend it two cents and just yeah. leave it, just leave it all night. <laughs> That's what Artie used to do to Paul Anka, or according to Artie, back in the what would that have been 70s or 80s? So it wouldn't have been so a very good harmonizer. So what would that do? What yeah. would that? What 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 actually would that do? Well, that, they hear sure. themselves through their monitors at the at a different pitch than what they're actually singing. They'll you spend know? the whole yeah. night trying, <laughs> trying to correct. Trying to catch up. They're the trying to catch up or sharp yeah. or whichever way you decide to bend them. Yep, it's crazy. It'll drive them. And up. also too, you know, especially That's if funny. they're on in ears. <laughs> uh, if people are on in ear, uh, inexperienced vocalists on in ears. If they have bad mic technique, if they get close on in ears, they go sharp, typically, you know, because they hear themselves louder. And if they're close, they're going to be uh, they're they're going to they're going to be sharp versus the rest of the band. So, um, you know, and I don't know how you deal. Well, obviously, you deal with it really well, Kenny, but man down here yes i'm singing from my belly button 
the interesting thing about that, Greg, is that he's got that mastered. In other words, yeah. with if he can feel, I don't know how he does it, but feel or hear or something, the house or the monitors or something, and it, if he's in between songs, he gets it way down there sometimes, but and it's fine and it just works. I just put that put his fader at maximum gain before it starts getting ringy, you know, and he just works it. And then I work the band around him as pretty much too. Then occasionally or often I'm riding his vocal just to get a little more half dB here, half dB there, but it's crazy. Do you use an expander on him or just compression? 5045 is my it's my my best friend. So now what how does this affect a guy with perfect pitch or a singer with perfect pitch, like for example, James Taylor, who is known to have perfect pitch? How would that affect him? Drive him crazy. He'd go, I can't, this can't be right. He would he would be, he would be driven crazy, would he not, Kurt? I mean, he would be going, oh, yeah. I know I'm singing an A, it's coming out A sharp, you know, kind of in between A and A sharp, you know. Yeah, that's when they take your plugins out, you know. They'll pull one out and go, what's wrong? Yeah. Well, if I ever get a chance to do Anita Baker again, and I happen to be mixing monitors, <laughs> I, will, I know my plan. Really? Seriously? That's what you want to do? <laughs> no. Makes it guy's shop. It's an opinion. Remember, do your own research. <laughs> no. Let me ask you this. What was, your, what was your experience with Anita Baker in the past? Oh, we provided PA for her because it has to be Meyer. And the whole thing, it has to be Meyer wedges and a brand new hundred foot cable and no splitter and all this other crazy stuff. Can't go through a split. It has to go hundred foot brand new cable that you have to open in front of her. It has to go straight into the monitor console and then come line level out down its own individual wire. That's not part of the snake to front of house into the front of house console. And it can never go through a splitter. You uh, know the reasoning behind that? I mean, their Somebody, reasoning behind that? I don't know. Somebody told her that She's... one day. She's insane and she's hard to deal with. Don't forget, well, you know, listen, very, listen, very listen. difficult. She to deal calls with. herself. She calls herself the crazy lady, or at least she did when I worked for her. And she knew that she was over the top crazy, but she must have a reason for any of that. It must have been that somebody told her that's the right thing to do. Somebody you know, told our, her our, that. When I worked for her, we had uh, preamps. You know, it was before everybody had Avalons and preamps like that. But yeah. we have John, what were the what were the preamps? John Hardy or something. Go meek, maybe? No, no, they were. I think they were single space black little things, like two thousand dollars a channel or something. I think it was John Hardy, maybe. Yeah, John Hardy sounds familiar. Anyway, and it, we just went right from that preamp, and we went into a splitter and stuff. But somebody must have taught her that you don't want to do that because that's what messes up your sound. You need to have the pure, pure sound. I think sound something got unplugged right once or something. I don't know. I we they didn't explain it to us. They just told us what it had to be, and then we yeah, had to. Yeah, yeah. Matching right, so wedges. I worked with her after that, well after that. She had gone to Midas training school. Wait, she went to Full Sail, you mean? No, well, I don't know. She went to somebody. She took a class at the Midas board. And so what she insisted on was that I take her mic, put it into the console, take the direct out, and go into the amplifier. For her monitors, I had no control except game. That was it. Well, and did you did she not use an in ears on that? No, she was using floor monitors. Oh, interesting. Okay. And the front of house guy had it into a little bit of feedback, and she blamed me for that. And I wasn't touching the console. There was nothing I could do. So I, what I actually did was is I got I put a reverb feed together because she had a single. I guess it was UPA. She had a single UPA. A UPM in front of her. And then I put a left and right stereo in U front of her. For UM1, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a UM1. So then I, I I gave her a separate reverb send and I he said, How's this? And that was it. And that was it. I, there was nothing else I could do. No EQ, no nothing. Yeah, she insisted on the UMs when I did her in Seattle and they were impossible to get. We had to get them from Meyer directly and they dug them out of some back rooms wow. there. And wow. You had to provide a, a, I think it was a SIM trace that showed that they were identically matched. Oh my she gosh, somebody has gotten to her and made her even more crazy than she was when I worked oh, She her. fired her monitor guy in the middle of the show and I was supplying stacks of racks and you know, it was another company who was doing the, the gig. Um, 
and there was nobody at the monitor console. And I start to walk over there because I'm thinking, well, somebody should at least be near this thing in case something happens. Because she fired the guy right in the middle of the show, and the stage manager gave him you know, like 500 bucks and pointed at the back door, and he walked out, with, picked up his backpack, and left with half the show left to do. And I start walking towards the console, and the tour manager guy, her manager, grabs my shoulder and it stops me. He says, if you know what's good for you, you won't get within 50 feet of that thing. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. My name is Kenny. not all cases. Well, that show Kenny. that I, I got fired in the middle of the show, too. And uh, I walked out front and listened to, you know, what the guy was doing. And I heard it squeaking the whole show. And then she wouldn't pay me. I actually had to take her, uh, threaten her to take her to court. I kept sending her lawyers letters. And she finally said, every time my lawyer writes me, it's another $500. So she paid me. But it took months to get paid from her. You are talking about Anita Baker, all Baker's concerts. Uh, whatever it was, I mean, I know I had a lawyer. All I had contact was was a, a lawyer. So every time I sent the lawyer a letter saying I haven't gotten paid yet, it cost her a lot of money. And she finally said, "Okay, I'll pay you." <laughs> stop torturing my stop making stop costing me money from other people. Yeah, right. Now, now Kenny, wasn't it you who did a Nita Baker at at a theater and got a horrible sound review or something like that? Yeah, but worst she, ever. Yeah, talk about the, it. The head, the headline in the LA Times was "Not So Quiet Storm Storms Into the Universal Amphitheater" or something like that, or something said something about Nine Inch Nails, uh, Nita Baker, blah blah blah, and it went on to just talk about what song she did and how bad the sound was this and how bad the sound was that. Oh, I got a whole story for you if you want to hear it. <laughs> and I got the, well, and I got, the, I got the newspaper also the news I because I dug up the newspaper article I found out what date it was and stuff and those kind of things are now available online so I now have a copy of the newspaper I could show you so we have it framed on the wall no no but anyway <laughs> yeah. but, here, but the moral yeah. of, moral you of the story put it in your great. resume put yeah, it in because, your resume because <laughs> because here's the here's the thing that was amazing about this Kurt despite all this stuff we've heard about her and despite all this stuff we know about how she acts towards sound people so. I I knew for a fact that I was getting fired that night. When I went to the gig, there was no way any performer would allow that kind of review and allow the front house guy to continue working for her. There's no way I should have kept that gig. So I said, I may as well just cut to the chase here. I got to the gig and she was down on stage like rehearsing or you know just getting the feel for the stage without, before the band got there. So I went down to the stage. I said, I'm really sorry about that review. She said, what review? I said, oh, you know, the LA Times. And she said, just a little paper. And she said, oh, don't worry about a thing. That, these are my reviewers right here. And I see them having a great time. And she's pointing to the front rows of the audience. I was like, fantastic. OK, all that stuff we hear about you is not true, apparently. And I went on to work with her, I went on to work with her for a few more months before I got the Julio gig, which took me away from her. And I never, got, never actually got fired from her. That's cool. That's a, that's a great story. You know, you know what I think next week, what we should do is horror stories from the road. You know, everyone, everybody's got a horror story. And uh, I, I think that would make good, you know, good listening. And uh, Wayne, I'm, I'm sure you even have a horror story too, right? I'd have a few. I'd have a few. Good, good. So you'll have something Especially, to say next week. All right. That's enough. We've heard enough from Wayne. All right. Next. Moving on. No, I'm only joking, Wayne. Come on. But Ken Porter is in the room, ladies and gentlemen. We haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. Uh, how you doing there, Kenny? I All think, right, there you I go. Think, I think Ken Porter's room is in the room. Oh, that okay. That's what I was just going to say. Oh, oh, his room is in the room. Up oh, there it is. Not so quiet. Storm blast into town. Now, did they spell your name correctly, Kenny? I think Ken's cooking. Ken Newman, you know, I don't yeah, see your well, name I in, just, the, in the No, I, they, didn't, they didn't spell my name right at all. But they just said, <laughs> maybe she spent too much time watching MTV during her four-year break from concerts and became enthralled with the thunderous sonic assault of Metallica. Or maybe someone just forgot to turn down the volume Tuesday at the Universal Amphitheater. It's hard to figure. <laughs> anyway, so when I, call, I actually called that reviewer on the phone and I said, eh, can I speak to Robert Hilburn, please? And I spoke to Robert Hilburn and I said, what show are you at again? And he said, 
uh, he told me which show. And I said, well, because I was at that show and I thought it sounded great. And, and he said, well, you know, I just thought they could have made her vocal a little louder. I was like, oh, well, that's nice. I wish you would have said that because I'm the fucking guy that said <laughs> that, that, that didn't turn down the volume. <laughs> and I almost got oh. fired because of your review. Anyway, pretty funny. Uh, well, so. He says it's a high decibel thing, but what he really wanted was more of her vocal. I can't imagine anyone mixing her show at like Metallica level. Like that wouldn't even yeah. happen. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't particularly loud, but it was. But that's the way they wanted it. They wanted the vocal tucked in. They didn't want it, uh, you know, uh, predominant like like her records and stuff. So that's too I mean, much her, cowbell, her, right? Too much her, cowbell. Her record, that was the record problem. producer sat right next to me and, and commented on what it was doing. He would say more or less vocal or more or less things, you know. And it was just one of those not so vocal heavy mixes that he wanted. So sure. More enough. cowbell. More cowbell. And I remember. And you know who was this? You know who what? You know who was the system? The sim guy at that uh, venue for for me. Because it was like we had a, a sim system on the road with us uh, for all the shows. And that was kind of unique in those days. Not a lot of shows had yeah. sim systems because it, it was pretty, pretty smart. No, but next best thing, who? Dave Lawler. No, Dave Lawler. That's the funny thing. Dave Lawler had to leave because he had to go do monitors for Barry Manilow because we had both left Barry Manilow to go do this Anita Baker thing. And then Barry Manilow sprung a week of work on on everybody and so i couldn't leave but dave said i'll get somebody to replace me and that somebody was come on Kurt, you must be. Kurt, ken porter was ken porter no 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 Kurt, was it no close close vishwadi close randy who, white who, who runs smart mccarthy oh no that's that's meyer oh yeah jamie anderson was anderson? my sim guy Jamie Anderson simmed that system and made it sound like nine inch nails. It was fantastic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was great. Anyway, Jamie Anderson was the sim guy and I was just, you know, it sounded really good. It sounded uniform everywhere and everything, but it just wasn't enough vocal, but that's, that's why you said uh, it. Do you want to, what, what year was this? Oh, good question. Let's, let's bring up the article again and see what it was. I don't know. It, Jamie oh, was see. still at Meyer then. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he was still at Meyer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was an MSL three rig, probably. Uh, um, no, it was MSL fives. MSL five. Wow, good, good question. What date it was? I think it was ninety four. I think it was uh, the yeah, last week of ninety four. It'll be in the head. Hey, Ken 94. Porter, how you doing, buddy? You look good. You look really good. You look like you just got your ears lowered. How much? I think it's free. Can you? Oh, wait a second. Let me. I'll unmute. I'll unmute you from here. I'll unmute you. There you go. You're unmuted. You won't let me do much, or I can't know if I'm talking or not. Do you hear anything? Yeah. We hear you fine. All right. For some reason, it's not normal. It's got a weird thing, and it keeps some money. Meeting summary is on. Meeting is now streaming and live and custom streams, all sorts of stuff. Yes. Yes, those are true things. Everything you've read is true. True. You can't believe everything you read, though, in most cases. But in this case, it's it could accurate. be an opinion. But that is uh, is a fact. It's not an opinion. That's a fact. Yes. All right. So how you been? How's everything going? You must be really been busy. Busy bunch of traveling. Uh, ended up Vegas for a little bit, and then ended up uh, leaving Vegas Thursday morning and went to College Station, Texas, for the George Strait event. It was way too hot down there. <laughs> That was big. That was a big event, the George Strait event, right? Wow. Was, were you doing sound there? for that giant, gi that giant George Strait gig? Yep. Wow. Good for you. That was amazing. That was record setting, right? Yeah. How many people? 110,940 for a ticket sold for a one day show. A single Holy performer, hell. single performer, no tracks. No. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that was a big rig, man. I saw the photos of that. It was mighty impressive. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I guess so. Tell us a little bit about the gig, because I, I I only read about it. But what 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 was the whole concept? Was this his last show, or did they bring him out? They bring him back from the dead. What happened? Oh, he's been. He is seventy two, I think. Somewhere That's it. There. Yep. Well, the rest of the band is older. A lot of the band members are older. Several of them have died this past year um, of the Ace and the Hole band, but he's still out there. Um, we're doing, we had, was it nine or 10 stadium dates this year? And that was just the one in Texas they wanted to do in the round. 
So I would not be surprised if we do the is fine with that. I wouldn't be surprised if we do more in the round next year. <laughs> um, I got they're in Salt Lake City this week weekend. They got a weekend off, and then they go to Detroit, and then they're in Chicago the twentieth, and then they're off till the first week of December in um, Las Vegas at the uh, uh, what's that baseball football stadium? Um, Allegiant. Allegiant. Allegiant Field. Yep. Are these Speaking enclosed of, stadiums, roof stadiums? Uh, some are, some aren't. We do. How, are, how do you, you hang in the round? stadium in the round? Yeah, without. Uh, if, you, if you see the stage, um, G2 has come up. G2, Bramer, whatever, used to own some a part of Brown United, and G2 has built a new um, pole tower, you know, that steel pipe pole tower system that can do, you know, 60, 70, whatever. It depends on the footprint. We were fairly narrow footprint since it's a country band. Doesn't need uh, 80 foot. They were more like 60, 48 to 50 um, between poles. So that controlled how tall, tall we could go with the uh, towers. But I mean, it holds a lot of weight. So That's ground support though, ground support. Yep. Basically a trussing system uh, reminds me of the uh... The U2 in the round tour. Yep. Well, Do they have been water some... ballast? The big tanks on the ground? Uh, yes, they had tanks in the, in the structure and stuff underneath and, and how it went. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I well, flew delays on pretty amazing. Like that up here from G2. Now, yep. now didn't, didn't Ed Shearing have a problem at Allegiant within the, within the round where they had to cancel the show at the last minute because it wasn't safe? The stage wasn't safe? Uh, yes. He did. Yeah. They canceled it. Did you and rescheduled it for a couple months later? Yeah. So Ken, what kind of gear do you got on 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 a on a system like that? What what's he playing through? Well, that was a one off uh, there. So so we kind of had had to change some of the stuff we had out on the major tour, the regular tour dates. But we had uh, twenty four GSL uh, facing the long ends, and I had uh, twenty four KSL. In each corner, facing the the short wide, the fifty yard line side. And then I had subs hung in each corner in between them, and then I had subs in front fill. So that's D and B. You use a D and B, right? All D and B. Yep. Right. And what kind of console did you have on yeah. front? Well, that was the house engineer George. Um, oh, what's George's last name? George. Uh, but anyway, uh, George Strait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sings in Mitchell, right? We're getting old. All right. Yeah. Uh, he had SD12. And Bangs was doing monitors, and he has uh, uh, S5000, Allen and Heath. You know Mike Bangs? Hmm. I don't know him, but the, and, and now was there any any challenge <laughs> in, um, in, in signal crossing you know whatever uh, uh what's gain sharing with the difference in the consoles nope everything worked fine in fact analog, the next analog we split had, i'm guessing we it's an analog split but we also had um uh malcolm whatever from austin's truck there and he did uh tracking recording and uh chuck ainley came down and tracked stuff that we needed for he's going to do a, an album release live album stuff Well, very good. So it all went well, all went smooth. Yep. Everything is good. Yep. Speaking all of all's well Heath, that did, ends well. Did anybody go to the Allen Heath booth or demo room at Infocom? The answer know. would be no. So tell me what 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 did you find out? Well, they basically have a uh, you can update the a card in the con in the uh, DSP now. And it has more processing power, and it can run the uh, eight plugins that they have. And one of them's an auto tune, another one's a high end reverb, a a uh, doubler. You know, there's a lot of decent stuff in the EQ wise. But I just wonder why other manufacturers don't do additional <clears throat> DSP to run the the stuff there, and instead of sucking all the DSP power in the console. So. I can't answer that, but I bet Tom Dare was pretty happy. I'll bet oh, he was yeah. happy. I saw him. He was smiling. 
Oh yeah, I'm bet I'll bet you know what a change going from uh, a company that was basically phasing out of the industry into a company that is aggressive now to pick up as much market share as they can. Why don't you get Tom Dura to come on and tell us all about it? I I would like that. I think that's a good idea. But mm -hmm. next week I'd like to do horror stories, horror stories from the road, uh, and uh, you oh. know rather than the Alan Heath show. How about horror stories of the worst catering you ever had? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I was thinking, Jan, it's, it's cool that we can laugh at these horror stories now because when they're happening, that's nightmare. That is live nightmares actually coming true. But when they're, you know, a few years later, it's like, oh yeah, remember when we did that? <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. I yeah. got stuck I in bet a you country have some of, Yeah. Mm. Or yeah, I've got a few thing. horror stories of myself to share. <laughs> or how about bathroom raiding the bathrooms? You know, a porta potty is always zero <laughs> when it's out in the sun in the in the middle of a field for days. Oh lord! But there's some others. It's like, woo! I can't even hold my breath to go in there. I'm surprised you don't have that in your rider. You know, a a personalized porta potty. Just behind the uh, the the mixing position. That's it. Well, know? one time sanitized and personal. One time there was a porta potty behind the mix position when I was doing Electric Daisy in Vegas years ago. And about three in the morning, I it was things were going on. I, the everything was fine. Although when I set my water bottle down on the case, it kept bouncing off the case, so I couldn't leave it there. And I went around the back to the the porta potty and opened the door, and there was a pile of toilet paper. And every time the bass drum hit, it was rolling off the roll onto the porta potty. <laughs> Can I thought uh, you were the show say is there was going somebody, to shit there was now. Somebody in, there was somebody in your personal porta potty. Oh, that that happens too. <laughs> oh my, nice. Now uh, I'll tell you, you know, some of these porta potties are really, really nice. I never, I never had this experience, but I was flying back from to I don't know where I was, but I was sitting next to the guy, and it turns out he was from Live Nation doing Electric Daisy, and he said, you wanted to come? And I, I don't know, you know, too many people. He said, listen, I'll get you a parking spot right in front. No worries. You know, you'll have VIP treatment all the way. I said, all right, I'll go. So I went there. It was really amazing how the VIP treatment can be in, a, in Las Vegas in a field. And so I went to the bathroom, and it was a marble porta potty. I mean, it was gorgeous inside, gorgeous. And I'm I'm taking a piss, and the guy next to me, and I'm saying, "My God, this is marble." And the guy next to me says, "What do you expect for fifty thousand dollars a ticket?" You know, <laughs> I have no idea what they charge for something like that. You know. Yeah, but that wasn't really a porta potty. That was a portable truck trailer uh, bathrooms. <laughs> Yes, but what it was super nice, Don't super nice. Star, Not just nice. Star something, star porta potties or star yeah, bodies. So the other thing too, did anybody see? You know, the past couple of weeks they've been having the uh, the Olympic trials going on and swimming in Indianapolis. Yeah, they built a pool in a football. In stadium. the fucking split, is that amazing or what? Yeah. Well, that did you see incredible. that that's going to show up in 2028 in uh, SoFi Stadium? In LA, they're yeah. going to do. They're going in LA. The Olympics is going to have swimming in the o, uh, SoFi Stadium. In the wow. same same kind of deal. In other words, they're going to dig a swimming pool, right, Olympic so size it, swimming pool into. No, the, you think it, about it. When you think it on, about it, you know, uh, I mean, the Olympic trials. You got uh, look at how many tickets you could sell at, and you know those tickets are current price tickets. You know, so and for Olympics. You know, you're gonna. It's going to be the same like Super Bowl tickets. So what are you trying to say? We've all turned into money. Uh, you know, money grabbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, point, the point is, they build that. They build the plat. They build the pool structure around on the field and all the other stuff, and then they build the deck up around it so it's a false floor mm -hmm. over on top of it all. Oh, and they have they all elevate, the filtration they elevate underneath. the ground instead of digging into the ground. They elevate the ground around it. Yeah, that that they do? Oh, right. it's so, like oh. Disneyland. It's like Disney World. When you go to Magic Kingdom, you're on the second floor. Okay, there's the main floor is underneath, and all you know, all of that happens underneath. 
that's exactly what they did in the stadium. And oh, I see. Uh, that's a the lot of weight. I was thinking, I was thinking they dug, the pool they, was eight they, feet they tall. Yeah, that's a lot over of weight. I'm not a mathematician, pool. but I know that that's a ton of more than a ton of weight. That's like you know the most weight you could possibly have. Water is heavy. Well, they just did it successfully. Yes. Yeah. No, they know they can do it. Lucas, what's, uh, what's, Lucas what's the or, what's the water uh, sitting on? Field. The water sitting on the ground, the ground right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, because they removed the football field and the football poles to build to build it. Yeah, and they and brought it, it contained over uh, two two million gallons of water as well. I That's not it. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, what picture is that? Wow. It looks like a race a racetrack. Yeah, uh, it looks like they're racing speedboats around it. It's <laughs> like the, they it's filled the, it with water. It's the 1962 World's Fair at Seattle Memorial Coliseum. They built an indoor boat racing venue. Wow! In the stadium. Wow! In '62, I've done concerts like right where that boat's coming around the corner. About that. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Very, I very, don't know. Very I cool. just, I, I just, I looked at the economics of it, and it, you know, they had how many days of the uh, Olympic swimming trials were there the broadcast on weeks. TV? There was two five weeks. days, two weeks probably. No, well, they're having problems weeks. right now in France. I just read an article that that the the Seine's River, where where they were going there, where they were planning on having the swimming out in the river or the boating, is polluted too much. Have they you can't. heard about the protesters' plan? Oh, so they yeah. actually <laughs> they actually they actually put up on social media in French at exactly what time you're supposed to go have a poop in the river, and yeah, because they're super <laughs> upset about it and. It, it's because the the Seine, you know, it, it it's a it's a complex river system. So they have Chris, you know tributaries. The, the, basis, the, the basis of the time that they want you to do it is so it will uh, coordinate with when the mayor yes is supposed exactly. to go swim in the river to prove it's fine. Correct. So it's, with, oh, is with, that funny? With, La mer. With, Isn't it called with La, with La mer? La poop. La mer. Plus Macron, so it's it's going to be the mayor and the president that are going to go swimming with some brown trout. It should be. How do you how do you how do you sell shit and how do you say shit in France? Isn't it La Mer, La Mer, La Mer, 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 but Mer, Mer. But you can also say thing, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, can you imagine how it's going to be delivered? Mm. You know, I mean, do you just come there with a bucket? You know, or, oh, or, or I think I think they're, they're I think they're getting along the. They're well, they're, you know. they're getting very creative, and they just go down to the river and let it fly, and um, and you know clean up, and <laughs> that's it. I think I think Ken Newman is starting to question his choices of participation right now. <laughs> just like uh, questioning the earth, the the society, the human society. It's like uh, going over the top. So hey, the wasn't wasn't the opening... we get from Yamaha consoles to this so fast? Wasn't the opening right. ceremony supposed to be a uh, each one coming in like a canal boat or whatever down the Seine? It was going to be people all around the Seine River, and it's going to they would come into uh, down the river to Seine. There was something I heard about that. Yeah. Well, awesome. Fred's going to be uh, Fred's going to be working uh, at least part of the Olympics. I don't know what event she's doing. Well, but, the event uh, he wants to do is the surfing and stuff like that because they're doing a bunch of the Olympics, uh, some of the Olympics in uh, Tahiti in the French Polynesia. Uh, this is the first one without an actual central stadium location. It's it's never been done where there is no main place like for the opening ceremonies and stuff. There's no stadium. And yeah, you well, did well, see. You did see the schedule. One, one second, Ken. Says, one second, Chris. You got a yes. concert going on in the background there. You know, uh, I, have, I, I, I do. So I got a roll, gentlemen. Great to see you all. And, listen, uh, I want to tell you something. I was worried about you for a little while there because I was watching you when you were off screen and you were you were talking to somebody on the phone. Evidently, either that. You were you were so animated. Either that, or I thought you were going insane. And then I realized, oh, he's on the phone. First, I thought you were going insane, but you are yeah. insane because you hang out with us. So there you have it. 
I, I was driving around in Torino with a guy that worked at Fiat and we were in traffic leaving kind of downtown Torino, going out to his house in Piedemonte. And he had a cigarello and he had his knee on the steering wheel and he was making calls. And the entire time he was on the call, it was it was nonstop hand gestures. And, you know, sometimes the guy is screaming and getting upset and all of the hand movements and then just the knee underneath the wheel, keeping the car on the road. And then, you know, every once in a while, a little puff of the cigarette. They got a lot of Italy. That's just fantastic. Absolutely. Anyway, let's say goodbye to everybody on social media. We'll stay in the room. We got a lot to talk about. Next week, we'll either have somebody from Alan Heath or Horror Stories from the Road. I'll work on it this week, see what we can do. But thanks for coming, everybody, and watching. Uh, this was our 214th meeting, which means next week it'll be 215th meeting, uh, consecutive, nonstop without missing a week. That, to me, is pretty impressive. Uh, so thanks a lot for watching. Remember, everything you heard today was an opinion, so do your own research. And remember, above all, you make it happen. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you again next week. So uh, for me and all the gang, unless there's something that somebody wants to say before we say goodbye, we're saying goodbye right now. And then after we say goodbye, I got a picture of Ken Newman to show you all. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody. See so you this, next week. This is the case. And we are off the air. All right, so the is question this... next week is...